Mick Hill against Jordan Shepard. On paper, the six times world champion goes into this as favourite, but Jordan Shepard's a very dangerous player. Gareth, you were saying beforehand this could be a bit of a banana skin for Mick. Yeah, I think I said it would be a bit of a banana skin for both of the favourites of these two matches in Chris and Mick, and it was a banana skin for Chris, and at one point I did think he was in trouble in that match, but great players do win when they're not at the best, and Chris definitely wasn't at his best there, but still you have to find a way to win. And regarding this match, I did say in the studio there that I think that Mikhail is due a big performance on this stage. I think he'd probably be the first to tell you that by his incredibly high standards, he uh, hasn't really performed over the, this past season the way that he would like to. And I do think he is due a a big performance and I called it in the studio that I think it could possibly be today. I don't know why, I just have a feeling that he's going to play well. Yeah, I think the fact he spent quite a lot of time doing commentary and studio work with us, he's probably got the hunger for it. He's seen a lot of good performances. He wants to show people that he's still a player as well as a pundit. He's had a couple of good results this season. He had one runner-up spot a couple of events ago. That's pushed him up to number 10 in the rankings, which is why he's the seeded player for this match. But certainly not nine players in the tournament better than Mick. So it looks a pretty good opportunity in this first frame to get himself going. Yeah, he just sees pointing his cue there, so he's going to leave the yellow that's on the top cushion until last, and he'll just flick it in with a bit of left-hand side. And the reason why he'll play it with left-hand side is because he'd like to take the cue ball closer to the eight ball. So if you just watch this, he'll play it with left-hand side and just spin the cue ball. You see that he's aiming left. See that? Just spins towards the eight ball. Played it perfectly. Yeah, it was a good camera angle. You could just see the spin taking off the top cushion. So, a very solid first frame for Mick. I think important to not so much get a good start in the sense that he's not familiar with the arena, but I think you just want to stop Jordan. He's the kind of confidence player you don't want getting up ahead of steam. So, Mick will be happy to keep him sat in his chair. Yeah, I think that's exactly right, and it's a good point. Somebody like Jordan, once he gets his tail up and sort of gets ahead of you in a match early on, he's the type of guy that can run away with it, so Mick will be conscious of that. Jordan saying in his pre-match interview that he hadn't been playing so much pool in the last few months, so I think he'll be needing to do a bit of practising ahead of the next season. Joining as one of the new pros for the 2022 season. And just as we're about to take a look at Mick's break, I do think it's something that hasn't been as good as he perhaps would like over this past season. And that one... Although I don't think he hit him bad, I don't think he hit him great, but it was a bit of what we call a slug rack there. So what we mean by that in the the, the pool world terminology of a, a slack rack or a slug rack is basically one or some of the 15 balls are not touching. And what that does is it causes the balls not to break properly. As you can see in this frame, they've all gone a little bit messy and scrappy and a lot of that was down to all 15 balls not being touching there and people always think it's the head ball that causes that to happen and it isn't always the case it's sometimes the two balls either side of the eight ball that's something to bear in mind it isn't always the top ball yeah it wasn't the best split but it's still quite surprising when that Black tracked over towards the bottom left-hand corner pocket. It looked like a ball would still be potted, but came up dry, which is why Jordan's got this opportunity. He'll be glad that he's at the table, of course, but not the easiest first go of the match. Now, and in the international eight-ball rules, having a ball over the pocket like this isn't 
necessarily an advantage, sometimes it's a disadvantage. Yeah, it wouldn't be so bad if he didn't have any other yellows in that area, but the fact that he's going to need use of the pocket, he doesn't really want to get the black stuck over that. Well, he got the first part of the shot right, but he got the second part of the shot wrong because he wanted to take the yellow that the cue ball's next to next and then play the double. Obviously, he can't play the double while that yellow's there. So the first shot, part of the shot was correct. The second part of the cue ball was wrong. And now he's in a little bit of trouble. Yeah, so forced into playing, well, kind of a plant double, but never much prospect of that really going in, I don't think. And at first glance, you may think that these reds are a little bit scrappy, but they're actually a little bit better than they look because the red across the bottom cushion here, Mick can play half ball off the eight ball, which will then free the bad red. So you'll see Mick look to get the cue ball onto this top cushion as quick as possible. when you're playing a ball and off a ball and moving another ball as he will be doing here you want as many options on the table as possible Mick's looking at defending straight away here so he's looking at just hiding the cue ball so I don't think he's gained much of an advantage there if anything it's gone a little bit maybe worse than it was because he now can't play red off, off black but I yeah, think I'm he's just locked the frame up a little bit yeah, I'm slightly surprised like you. It looked like it was a decent opportunity. Generally, you don't want to, when you've got an OK layout, you don't want to let somebody back to the table and mess it up for you. So that was a, a fluke, but that time it was a fluke that hasn't really done him any favours. If you no. see the yellow there, snicks the red, snicks the other yellow and finds its way into the middle. Well, that's a good shot. You see Mick taps the table with his chalk there and shakes his head because he knows that's a good shot. And I do think that Mick probably should have gone for the finish that last visit, and now he hasn't. He's sort of paid the price because Jordan has played a very clever shot, got the black over the pocket, and it's um, locked the frame up here to a point where we're either going to see somebody knock the eight ball in and lose the frame, or we're going to see a re-rack. Yeah, from Mick's point of view, something of a worst-case scenario, getting the black over that pocket, because that was the one thing that was going to stop him going for the game. It did come from that fluke that I said was a bad fluke, and as it turned out, it was an advantage because it enabled him to put the eight ball over the pocket, and that's a good shot. That's another clever shot there from Jordan. Yeah, ordinarily having more balls on the table is advantageous. So when he first fleeted that yellow, I, I agree with you. It looked like it wasn't going to help him. But suddenly Jordan's edged himself into quite a positive position in this frame. So mixed problem fairly clear to see the red tied up next to the eight ball yeah and he tried to just graze the red there didn't he so he could just move the black a couple of millimeters and try to make space for the red to go past it but he did hit it but it was only taking the paint off hitting it it wasn't a a bump and it was that he needed to just bump the eight ball to that back cushion and i think mick now needs to somehow either hide the cue ball or cover this eight ball up. Yeah, he'd love to be able to cover the eight ball up, but it's not going to be straightforward. And this is when the shot clock really puts you under pressure because you've used your extension. You know you're coming now to 10 seconds, you know the bleep's coming after another five seconds and you don't always play the shot that you perhaps would. And this looks pacey. Well, he hasn't potted the eight, but he's still in the trouble here. So that's like Grimace on Mick's face tells me that 
if Jordan pots both of these yellows and leaves the cue ball somewhere near this bottom cushion, there is enough space for the cue ball to get through. No immediate hurry, of course, for Jordan to do that. Although Mick will be trying to tie the position up. So. I mean, this is unusual in international rules to get into this position. It's only really when you get the eight ball over the pocket that it becomes an issue. Otherwise, a player would have potted it by now. Yeah, and if the cue ball now doesn't go through the gap, as I was, as I was suggesting before, then this frame is going to be a re-rack. Yeah, I think this may be the first re-rack we've seen in this tournament. It's not something that comes up very often. So just to make you aware that the rules of why it would be a re-rack are that if the cue ball physically can't get to the object ball as they can't I don't think in this instance to the eight ball over the pocket if there isn't a gap that the cue ball physically fits through there Mick would have to make a foul he would have no choice but to make a foul so therefore it would be a re-rack if there was space for the cue ball to fit through that gap and of course it wouldn't be a re-rack yeah, and what matters is, as you say, whether you can get the ball through, not whether it's possible to play a, a shot. Like Sometimes you can get in a position where the ball would go through, but you just can't get into the position to play it. Well, this shot will tell us the answer to that, because if Mick feels the cue ball doesn't pass through, he won't risk touching this. The fact he's t risking touching it tells me he thinks there's a chance it does, and after this shot, it won't. Yeah, it's very hard to tell, isn't it? Even from the overhead shot, it looks extremely close. So Mick must feel there's a chance that the cue ball passed before, and that's why he just was trying to bump the red a bit further down to make doubly sure. He's having another look to... Mm, there looks, looks enough space there to me from that camera angle that the cue ball can get through. Yeah, I agree. So, could he like to try and get another ball down into that area at some point? If Jordan was to pot the remaining last yellow and try to pot the eight ball, he has to be careful because if he grazes that red at any point before contact with the eight ball, it is foul and loss of frame. Well, well he can't pot it from there. No. And this is now where the ref has to step in and make the decision of is the cue ball or can the cue ball legally pass? So you have to make a bona fide attempt to hit your ball. I guess Jordan did enough there. It was obviously going to make sense to her on the side of being short rather than over hitting that shot. Yeah, and Mick has, is obviously unsure, so he's just going to bump him. He does have the option of playing another red into the gap, of course, to completely block it off. He doesn't have to play this. He could play the other red down into the gap. Which I'm quite surprised he hasn't, to be honest. Yeah, I think I might be tempted. I mean, it's not... The trouble is, with these rules, only, you only get one visit. He's never really going to get the opportunity to get the difficult ball out, is he? Well, I think you might see him push this red into the gap now. And if he pushes the red into the gap, it is a re-rack. And the player that broke in this frame breaks again, which is Mick. Yeah, I mean, surely in Mick's shoes you'd be happy with that outcome, given where he is in this frame. Without a doubt. He has to play the red into the gap and settle for the re-rack. It's his break. I'm not sure... Exactly what he's thinking here. The only possible explanation is he's trying to make Jordan attempt it and foul on the way through, but I don't think Jordan's ever going to hit anything hard enough. OK, you're right, you have to make a bona fide attempt, but... Surely in this position he's, he's got 
reds that are quite easy to get into the gap now. Yeah, it's a very unusual situation, this. We haven't had any frames in this tournament that have played out anything like this. Yeah, I mean, you may be right about him hoping Jordan goes for this, but Jordan's erred on the short side every time, which he's going to continue doing. This could very easily end up being the longest frame of the match and tournament at the rate it's going. So some kind of attempt to play off the two jaws of the bottom right-hand corner pocket. I think Mick is just asking the question to Scott, the referee here, is what is classed as a bona fide attempt or what is classed as a legitimate attempt at the, at the black? And you'd have to say that is quite a grey area. Yeah, I mean, he didn't get right into the jaws. I think he, he probably could have got a bit closer, but yeah, it's very subjective. I mean, basically, unless you go for the wrong ball, if you're, if you're clearly aiming for your opponent's ball, that's usually where the problem is. God, Mick needs to play a shot here. He doesn't want a time foul. Wow. That would have been a dramatic end to the frame. Well, it's made it hard for Jordan to hit this, but in a way that, you might say that, lets Jordan off the hook, because... Well... This is a, there's no, there's no set rule of you have to be within so many inches or you have to be within a certain distance of the eight ball. You have to make an attempt. And this is where the gray area comes because Jordan will say, well, I'm making an attempt. And Mick might say, well, no, you're not. Yeah, and I think that was good enough for Jordan, wasn't it? That was... That was as good an attempt as he could really make from the position. The referee's kind of set out his stall by not warning that any of these aren't a good attempt so far. So, well. I think Mick should just push the red into the gap, block the cue ball from going anywhere near the eight ball. Let's rack the balls up and let's start again. Well, I don't see how this gets resolved unless he plays that. He is doing it now. Ooh. So now we have the re-rack and that's the right shot. Well, a strange frame. Maybe took a bit longer to get to that point, but we, we got to that point in the end. Yeah, Mick, Mick took probably 15 shots to play that shot, but <laughs> we, we got <laughs> there in the end. And that, that is the, that, I think that is the right shot. That's the right call because it is a real grey area. Well, let's take a look at his profile where the referee racks up the balls. So Pro Series ranking 10, so he comes into this as one of the top 16 seeded players. Crucial to get into that top 16. I mean, it's hard to believe we were even talking about Mick potentially being outside it, but had a, a good run, as we say, to have a runner-up spot late on in the season that guaranteed that position. Six times world champion, six times European champion. So, after, what was that, five, ten minutes burnt off the clock, we're, we're going again. And that was better. I was talking about, I thought, Mick, that Mick maybe needed to improve his break and this was definitely an improvement. Okay, he doesn't catch the front ball head on, which something as players that you're trying to achieve. So you're trying to hit that front ball as square as possible. So the cue ball comes back in a straight line or even parks itself in the middle of the table. But he hit that with definitely a little bit more oomph in it. There's been a lot of talk this season about the quality of your break and the, the cue bending into the table as you, you play the shot. Yeah, and what, what a lot of that is, is you know, you're driving the power down through the bed of the table. It's then transfers, obviously, through the cue ball and then in turn through the hole of the pack. You see a lot of players, you know, they break and the cue flies up in the air, which effectively means you're losing a lot of power up into the into the ceiling. So... I feel like there's a lot of club owners that won't really want their players to be practicing your break because they'll probably be sticking it through the bays at some point. And just well. as we were talking about the break, mix a couple of seconds away here from going 2-0. 
Yeah, a bit, a bit quicker the second running of this frame. Mick will be a bit happier with the outcome. Well, yeah, that's certainly a contrast, isn't it, of two frames. We've just had a a tactical chess type frame and then all of a sudden Mick plays the safety shot that arguably he could have played five or ten minutes earlier and then within the space of a, just over a minute he breaks and clears. So, let's take a look at Jordan Shepard's profile. Five times shootout winner, so a real fan of the quick fire format. He'll be very happy when it gets down to the 15 second shot clock in the last ten minutes of the match. Five times a professional champion on the UK tour as well. Yeah, I mean, the only time you could see it would make sense to sort of burn the clock down like was happening in that last frame is if you were a couple of frames up and you were near the end of the match, but obviously still very early doors. Although, how often would you see a match involving Mikhail and Jordan Shepard where after 18 minutes only two frames have been played? Yeah, we just take another look at Jordan's break here. So you see he shakes his head a little bit and walks away back to his chair before he even finishes or the ball's even finished moving, he sort of resigned himself to the fact that he wasn't going to make a ball there. And I think the reason that the head shake came was because he felt as though it was another one of the slug racks. Yeah, very frustrating that as a player, although it's a, a tough job for the referee. Slippery new cloths to get all the balls touching isn't always easy. Yeah, and what, what happens is because the cloths are so fine and so quadruply shaved these days that even after a couple of sets of play that becomes a divot where the front ball sits and when you have that divot it effectively means that the front ball is sitting lower than the rest of the pack only fractionally of course but it is sitting lower which does affect the way that the balls break and it is a bit of a uh, a job for the Referees that, well, it's certainly not an envious one because you're supposed to get the balls touching every time and of course they want to get the balls touching but they can't always do that and the one time or the, the odd time that they don't, it's real frowned upon by the players. Yeah, it's been played in a pretty good spirit. We haven't seen much of the players going to look at the rack. Like Sometimes in tournaments you, you see a lot of that and that just puts extra pressure on the ref. Scott there, one of the best referees that we have, so of course he tries to get the balls touching, but you can't always get them absolutely perfect. They are using a, a triangle, as you see there, that's Scott, the, the head referee who does do a fantastic job, so it is a bit of a thankless task, especially racking the balls up, maybe moving to a... Uh, a magic rack strokes sharp rack in the future is something to consider. That way it eliminates any of this and guarantees that all the players get the 15 balls touching. But maybe that's something for the future and just as we get back to the action here, Jordan is going to have to play some kind of skill shot or some kind of developing shot here if he wants to clear it this visit and that shot tells me that he is going to go into the red so he's going to come off the side cushion here and he's going to either pop the yellow over the pocket and he's played that nice the only problem is the eight ball doesn't go into the right center which means he's got to now play this red across the back rail I was going to say at pace, but he's just dropped it in and he's now going to pot it into this top right corner. Yeah, and if he makes this eight ball, this has been a good finish because he's not in the most straightforward position when he came to the table. But it's not there. No, he'll be disappointed with that. That was a good chance to get his first frame on the board and he'd done a lot of the hard work. It's a horrible position, this, when you end up missing the eight ball. It's the only ball left on the table and your opponent's got so many options to sneak at you. Yeah, and that was a very good finish up to that point, and he just put a little bit of a quick one in there on the eight ball. What I mean by a quick one is the delivery from the top of the backswing where you hold the pause, which is where a lot of the timing comes from, was all a little bit quick, but 
he is under pressure he is 2-0 down and now he's in big bother because unless he somehow flukes the 8 ball here he's going to be 3-0 down yeah I mean he was probably always destined to lose the frame but that's just hastened that process now splitting the balls up and missing yeah, it's interesting what you say about putting in a quick one. He wasn't under time pressure there, but he was kind of under match pressure. What we see a lot of towards the end of the match is when it's down to the 15-second shot clock is that people don't really have time for the, the proper cue action. They end up having to play the shot with much less of a backswing than they would normally. Yeah, I think he might take the one past the eight ball now. I mean, he's just let the cue ball drift in a bit of a funny position it might not look like much but he's gonna have to go in and out of bulk now which definitely wasn't the plan nice recovery yeah back in pretty much perfect position now angle to come down for the last yellow next to the eight ball this has been good stuff so far from Mick no fireworks but just done what he needed to in many ways, that's what you need from these first round matches. This is Mick's first match in this tournament. It just needs to get through to the group final where he'll be playing Chris Melling. So not exactly a straightforward next match if he does get through this one. That's one that will be a real crowd favourite. That should be a, a great quality match if that is the next one we see. Yeah, we just take a look at this uh, skill shot again here. Plays it perfectly, but as you can see, the eight ball doesn't go into the centre, so he has to just drop it in and take his medicine if you like and settle for the eight ball into the corner and if you just watch from the top of the backswing gear it's all a little bit quick yeah it was by no means a formality but it was a kind of shot you would have backed him to putt frame four Mikhail to break so we're looking yeah, fairly comfortable as Mikhail breaks off in frame four another good break yeah, it didn't hit him as hard as the last one. Sort of sacrificed a little bit of power for control. But just take a look at these reds. That's the break that you want. Get that cue ball within that six to eight inch window on the back cushion. That's what you're trying to achieve. And when you hit him like that, you deserve to pot a ball. And he's not only potted a ball, but within a couple of minutes, you're going to see 4-0 because he isn't going to miss these reds. The eight ball does pass into the right centre. So he will leave these reds that are on the top cushion here, or certainly one of them, until last. Yeah, that's a good point you make about judging the quality of the break. When you see the cue ball just come back in a straight line and you saw it moving straight back, it didn't have lots of spin. Sometimes you see it spinning on its own axis. That's normally an indication you've put some unwanted side on it. Yeah, put some unwanted side or cued across it. And he hit that flush, as you say. No rotations of the spots on the cue ball means that he struck it in the middle. And that's been one of the great things. Obviously played with the spotted cue ball for a while, but camera quality has got better. You can just see so much more of the, the spin that players are playing with. Not quite what he had in mind, but still OK. So this would be the textbook way that you would teach somebody to take a finish out on an eight ball table. You would clear one end first and then clear the other, which means that the cue ball is doing the least amount of travel as possible. I think he will play the plant here and then play the other one and then play this one last. Very cleverly played the offset plant. That might not look like much, but he played the plant deliberately to not leave that red out directly over the pocket. You see how he's just left it on that knuckle, which makes this positional shot to the eight ball just that tad easier, which means it's just natural angle look, just bump off the cushion. Would have liked an extra couple of inches. Yeah, it's quite an acute angle when you see it from the overhead. From this angle, it looks quite easy, but actually you realise it's quite tight. No 
problem, though. Yeah, that's an interesting point. Often players are trying to play a plant to leave the ball right in the jaws of a pocket, but actually that's the most difficult place sometimes to play position from. So. And the reason why he left himself so short on this eight ball is because as a player, when you play a positional shot, especially like that last one that Mick played there, in your mind as a player, what you say is, what am I better off being here? Am I better off being too short or am I better off being too long? And of course, in that instance, if he overhits it, he's snookered behind the yellow. So in your mind, you edge on the side of caution and of course, he just underdid it. But he's better off underdoing it than overdoing it because as I say, if he overdoes it, he's snookered. If he underdoes it, he's probably still gonna pot the eight ball. And as we see a change of tactic from Jordan Shepard, he goes to the cut break. And not only does he go to the cut break, he goes to the looking like I have not got a care in the world pool. He's down on the shot here before the cue balls finish rolling. We're about to get a glimpse of how he keeps winning this shootout title. So Jordan has now said, I've had enough of this. I'm just going to play as though it means nothing at all. Yeah, and that's okay. That's okay, but I was just about to say there's a balance of being quick and careless. And he has been a fraction careless here. It's taken longer to play this shot than all the previous six ones put together. Well, that could have gone wrong, but played the cannon well in the end. So that's one frame back, still a mountain to climb. He's got to win three more frames to level the scores up. But he's got time on the clock to do it, 12 minutes, 19 remaining. So particularly if he's going to play at that pace, plenty of time to get himself back into it. I think Mick will be pretty happy with the way the match has gone. 4-1 up against a player of Shepard's quality. It's a decent start to his campaign. Jordan was, in theory, in the qualifying round which took place on Boxing Day, but as a result of a couple of withdrawals because people weren't able to travel because of the restrictions, got a bye through that round, so it's also his first match of the tournament. Frame six. Big hill to break. I like the way this tournament's been structured with these group stages. I mean, it's good from the players' point of view that they know they're, they're playing their first couple of matches at the same time and it's not blocking their entire week, but it also just makes the draw a bit easier to follow for everyone. Yeah, good format, and even though they're called groups, it isn't how you would perhaps expect a group to be played. People think a group would be everybody plays everybody, but it is a, a straight knockout format. It's just you, you play your two matches in your little group, and if you win them both, you're through. It isn't a case of everybody plays everybody. So it's a group, but it's also a, a straight knockout format. Yeah, what it does mean is that whoever wins this match will be straight back on against Chris Melling, who won the previous match. I think generally, from the players we've seen being interviewed afterwards, the ones that have gone straight back on have kind of relished that. You can kind of make a case both ways. Sometimes it's good to have a break between matches. Sometimes it's better just to keep going. And... This is a big frame because if Mick wins it or clears here, then I think it's unlikely that Jordan will have enough time to get back into the match. It is a race to seven. Or the 40 minute shot clock, whichever comes first. And unless Mick runs out this match a seven one winner, I think it will be the shot clock that comes first. Yeah, which isn't something you necessarily have predicted with these two contesting the match, but largely down to that frame that turned into a re -rank. Yeah, and when you have a slow frame, when you have a match clock, and then you have a re -rack, and then you win that frame, it becomes even bigger, doesn't it? Because it's almost... I don't know what it was, maybe 12 minutes or something that in total of the two frames that's been wiped off the match clock, that frame then becomes even more significant. 
Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, obviously Mick didn't know what the outcome was going to be, but as it happens, he racked the balls up and had that great breaking clearance straight up. So it did play to his advantage, the fact that he'd burnt some of the time off. That bleep that you just heard is now the 15 second shot clock in operation, but the referee doesn't call it during the shot, so he will call it after Mick has played this shot. So they played with a 30 second time clock there, but still got down to the beeps. Yeah, and the incredible thing is this ball up the cushion may make Mick may choose to leave until last now and this would be the ball that Mick definitely wouldn't choose to leave until last and he's left it till last and if he's dead straight the only way he can get on the eight ball was if he screws back and plays half ball off the red so the red that the is just by his bridge hand here if he screws back and hits it half ball that's the only way Wow, he somehow went around the back of it. Yeah, that's incredible. When you see from the overhead, it doesn't look like there's room to get around the back of it. And, OK, Mikhail has missed quite an easy finish here, but I don't think it's really Mikhail that's missed the finish here. I think it's more that the shot clock has got him to a point where he just didn't know which way to go and which shot to play. And sometimes that shot clock does have your brain a little bit like mush and you just have to hit the ball basically and by doing that it means that you go the wrong way yeah i mean that's what makes for such great entertainment if you get a player of mixed caliber that's struggling with the shot clock you can imagine for other mere mortals how difficult it is wow that's a real let off from Sheppy that oh yeah i think he felt as though he had to go for the finish there and then but there was still plenty of time he didn't have to Wow, Mick's going to be incredibly relieved to get back to the table Frame. one shot later after missing that first black. Yeah, and I think, I think Jordan's panicked a little bit too early there. I think he thought eight minutes or so left. I'm 4-1 down, I have to go for the finish now, but he didn't. There's a 15-second shot clock in operation, just play the snooker. Mick only has 15 seconds to hit the cue ball. You're only effectively wiping 15 seconds off the shot clock, and... What you're also doing is making Mick move the eight ball off the cushion for you also. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I guess he wasn't expecting to miss the pot, but it wasn't the easiest cut he took on. Jordan Shepard to break. So now the match, you would say, effectively over, although never say never. No, you always have the uh, golden break. Yeah, I think a few and the golden duck options that can come into play, but I certainly don't think you're going to be seeing Extension Mick ball. hitting the break with any rockets when he comes to the table now. He'd be happy for the balls to go scrappy and just waste the shot clock down, but play a few safety shots. And if Jordan's going to win a frame, it won't be in uh, quick fire time. Yeah, to your right. We've only seen three golden breaks so far this week, all three of them from Scott Gillespie. Two in the match that he ultimately lost to Jack Whelan yesterday. I think, uh, he enjoyed the moments, but unfortunately it wasn't quite enough to get over the line. Yeah, and that's a good shot because he's left the angle to knock his bad red out. Mm, he's got a three ball plant, red onto yellow, onto red. And he's now got red off yellow into the same middle. It's been an entertaining finish if he makes it. And this time, a well, a straightforward in the sense he's not having to play a plant, but not the most straightforward eight ball. No mistake, though. It's almost like he's better when he's playing quicker like this and under a bit more pressure. Yeah, and I think what happens when you play like this is it's almost back against the wall type pool and when you're not thinking about it so much and you just get on with it the old saying play like it means nothing at all when it means everything easier said than done of course to just go out there and play like you're playing in practice or play like you haven't got a care in the world but 
I think the players that are more successful do that better than others. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. You've talked a few times in some of the studio segments about that transition where you can be practicing well and it's just hard to translate it to the match arena sometimes. Yeah, there's been a lot of players over the years that have been like that, been great players in practice and you think, oh, how has he not won this? How has he not done that? But um, mainly it's because they don't take what they do on the practice table into into the match. And I think that's the same for a lot of sports. Yeah, it really is. Meanwhile, though, Mick hasn't really done what you suggested. He's, unfortunately for him, broken very well and gone in off. So he's handed the table over with a beautiful open position. Yeah, and again, it's just that balance of playing quick and getting the finish and uh, the balance of rushing and being careless. And again, he was a bit careless there, but again, he's played another good cannon. And that is two very quick fire frames. And I did think that he was out of this match, but he's definitely now back in it. Yeah, five minutes 30 on the clock is more than enough to win two frames. If he could get a clearance off his own break here, suddenly the pressure's all back on Mech as he next comes to the table. So quite a lot riding on this break. Yeah, and isn't it amazing when you see it happen so many times when the players, I wouldn't say give up is the right word, but he's almost just back against the wall, said, well, the probability of me winning from here is very, very slim, so I'm just going to almost throw my arm at it. And the next minute, he's back in it, and he's made another ball, and he's got another very good split. The only thing I can see is he'd like to go reds and he has to pot one down this cushion first. If he pots this, I think he wins the frame. Red ball's in play. Whoa. He's now going to play a cannon. Another one. To just bump his bad ball out and that's worked out perfectly. What a grandstand finish this could be if he does win this frame. A few minutes ago it looked like the whole match was over. And this is always what Jordan's capable of, these quick fire frame wins. It is, but what happens with this now is the pressure now reverts back to Jordan because he's been free flowing with the mentality, as we've mentioned, of I've probably lost. His mentality now changes of I have a chance of winning again interesting to see if he gets a chance in this next frame first if he plays so quick because I don't think he will I think he'll go back to almost the playing pool properly mode yeah now not much Mick can really do there's no point going for a cautious break this time round he's really got to just again play to win plenty of time on the clock so it's not like he can afford to slow down at this point no, and the shot clock doesn't allow you to slow down. I mean, 15 seconds when you're out there under pressure, I can tell you, is br brutally okay. quick. <clears throat> McHill to break. Leading five frames to four. Oh, that's a better break. Oh, that's a fantastic break, but first glance, the reds look good. But he's, if he's dead straight on this red across the back cushion, it isn't easy. But he just had a bit of angle. Look, he played a good shot there. He manufactured a little bit of angle. Yeah, he struck that really well. I mean, this table's great like that. It's got the super fine cloth. You can manufacture an angle, but you've still got to cure it really sweet to do that. So, yeah, he's just had a look up at to the sky there because he wanted to take this red that he's on now, then he wanted to come all the way down the table to take the red out of the bottom end to leave the red up the end of the table for the eight ball down the cushion. And the reason he wanted to do that is because position from the eight ball from this bottom red is not easy. And that's why he's gone down for it now. Yeah, a lot of people will be looking at that thinking, what on earth is he doing playing such a difficult position of shot when he's right by the ball? But as you rightly say, it would be very hard to get position if you'd gone about it the other way. 
You can see he's really feeling it. I mean, yeah, as is everyone. Really with this. catching yeah, the shot clock. Sorry, is really catching him out, isn't it? I Every think he's he's sort of half forgetting about it, and then by the time he realises, it's bleeping and it's all a bit of a rush. Yeah, he just has that kind of startled look every time the five-second warning comes up. Oh, I think he forgot to play with a bit of right-hand side here because I expected him to play with a bit of right-hand side and take the cue ball towards the middle pocket, and he just potted it playing ball. Important pot, this. Yeah, and because he didn't play it with right-hand side, he's missed it. So, two minutes 23 on the match clock. Jordan Shepard. Oh, and... This might be doubly bad news because this yellow may pass the eight ball across the back cushion. Or does it? Looks tight, doesn't it? I don't think that's good enough. It's that's not because Mick can now play the skill shot. Red, uh, sorry, eight ball onto the yellow. Follow it in and that's the match. Frame. Well, wow. there was a lot riding on that frame. If Jordan had managed to clear up there and get it to five apiece, Mick would have been really feeling it. It's not necessarily over. There's still two minutes on the clock, but he's going to need something, probably a golden break, unless he can pull off your magic from the other day of the 28-second clearance. I did say, would Jordan slow down a little bit if he got a chance in that frame? And he did a little bit, even though it was only one shot. He used his extension. He had a look at it three or four times. That's the first time he's looked at a ball three or four times, probably since the first frame. I can tell you one thing. If that was 5-1 down, he wouldn't have been having a look at that yellow. I think he'd have just played it. Frame 11. Jordan Shepard like I said, when you frame feel like you're back four. in the match and you now have a chance of winning, he went back into the almost carry mode again. But... This isn't this isn't over yet, folks, because Red balls in he has a chance of clearing these reds and leaving a minute on the clock. Well, that's the grandstand finish the viewers are looking for. It's not the grandstand finish mix looking for, though. Well, that's just stopped him in his tracks because he's a little bit short. And he couldn't have had a better nudge. That is perfect. Well, he's going to leave, as you say, just over a minute, I think, on the clock. Oh, what? So. Oh, he has let, he is going to leave exactly a minute. 59 seconds, is it? 58? Well, the good oh, thing from Mick's point of view. What an incredible match. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing, isn't it? When it was 5-2, we were kind of saying it was all over, and it, it hadn't been that exciting in some of the early game, but it's, it's really up the ante towards the end. And this is exactly what we were expecting with these two, this kind of quick-fire stuff. This was the shot. Yeah, I mean, that was a lovely touch, wasn't it? That could have gone terribly wrong. Yeah, very, very good shot. That was a great touch with a lot of left-hand side and... Backspin to just kill the cue ball. And uh, so, Mick Hill to break, and he needs to make a ball. Yeah, it's all about making a ball, because if ball. He, he doesn't need to clear up, he just needs to stay at the table, that's yeah. the priority. If he makes a ball off the break, he's won. Has he made a ball? Oh, no way. No, he hasn't. And you heard Mick shout, don't you dare. And look at these reds. Look at these reds. That's amazing. There are balls flying everywhere and it's come dry. He doesn't need to rush like this. He has plenty of time. Plenty of time. And because he's rushing, he's run out of position. Wow. He doesn't need to rush like this. He's got time. So one good shot on this red down the right-hand rail. He doesn't want to be bridging over that yellow, and he isn't. He's just popped out. He can just cue down the side. Oh, wow. Wow, what a finish. 
incredible. What a finish. <laughs> Four se well, two seconds now as the match clock pauses. <laughs> match tied at six apiece. What a match. There were no signs. Well, we had that rack. They played for 12 minutes for a re-rack. Well, we never thought they'd be through 12 frames by now. What an incredible game. Oh, I'm speechless. So 4-1, Jordan starts running around the table like he's playing a six red shootout pace. And then the last two frames from 6-4, he does exactly the same and clears within the space of a, a couple of minutes. It's incredible. So one free hit effectively for Jordan. Could be a golden break, could be a golden duck. If not, it goes to a six red shootout. So golden break wins it, golden duck loses it. Wow, he got half of a golden duck. So we have a six red shootout. Wow, that's incredible. Well, the match has had absolutely everything. It's had the longest, most tactical frame, and then it's had probably four of the quickest well, frames. Well, this has been by far the most entertaining match that I think I've commentated on. I don't think I've seen a match where I've watched and thought, yes, it's over. No, it isn't. The other player's back in. Now it's over at 6-4. And incredibly, we're now at a shootout. And... One thing I will say in this shootout is your mentality going into it is very different. And what I mean by that is Mikhail is now standing there thinking, how the hell am I playing a shootout here? And Jordan Shepard is thinking, well, I'm over the moon, obviously, to be playing the shootout. So two very different approaches and mentality into this shootout, which could potentially be the factor. Mick sitting there thinking, well, I should already be doing my... Uh, pre-match interview now. Yeah, like Mick, you can just see etched on his face how annoyed he is to be in this position. He's got to put that out of his mind. It's him up first. I mean, what a story it's going to be for whichever of these players comes through. We thought the first group match was close when Chris Merlin won 6-5 against Dave McNamara, but this has had everything. And because of styles, you have to put Jordan favourite here for this, but of course it is all on the break. So the rules are you break and you have to pot the balls as fast as you possibly can. As long as the object ball that you're playing is stationary, you're allowed to play it. Scott said to Mick, do you know the rules? And he said, yeah, just pot as many balls as you can. Well, you need to pot as many as you can, but you need to pot them as fast as you can. Yeah, and the key thing is not to miss. Oh, and it's the perfect break. This is going to be quick. This is going to be quick. Oh, oh it's going to be missed. quick if you don't miss one. Oh, Mick's pressure, feeling the pressure. Could still be a decent time though. One good positional shot. Use the cue ball to stop moving. Oh, oh. Slow down. Oh, it's going to be it uh, 28. Mid 28s is middle of the road, I would say. Yeah, there was a moment that looked good if he hadn't have missed that ball to the top right hand corner. Yeah, mid 28s is. Uh, I would say average. I think it's probably going to get beat if I had to have a bet on it. I would say that Mix, as you can see there, pulled his face as if to say, mm, I'm not sure that's enough, and I don't think it's enough. Yeah, especially when you set that time first, because Jordan knows that he doesn't have to race around. He can be somewhat measured. Yeah, and that is the big advantage of winning the lag. You put your opponent in. You let them set the time, and if they don't set a particularly good time, then you have the luxury of not taking your time, but you can just make sure. Of course, it's still on the break. It's important here that Scott, our referee, gets all of these balls touching. Of course, there's not 15 to get touching. There's only 
six of them, so it is important that he gets them all touching because if they no, don't break, yeah. that is the difference between winning and losing. Oh, that's not the best break. And they haven't really broke. Oh, the cue ball's still moving. So, he's got a bit of travelling to do. Ideally, you want the balls clustered at the bottom of the table. He's going to have to come up to the one on the break yeah, line. This is going to be quick. This is going to be good, and this is going to be quick because the cue ball isn't travelling. When the cue ball's not travelling, you're wasting no seconds. This ball for the match, and it's there. What a performance from Jordan Shepard to get herself back into that match. Well, what a fantastic performance. And, wow, have you ever seen a match swing around like that? And I think, as you can see there, he's pretty happy with that win.